And it was from a light, trust me, it wasn't from me. Okay, good morning, everybody. We're in April, and this month we are going to take a look at abundance, about sharing and appreciating and celebrating all of the magnificence that's in life, that's in each of our lives. It's inherently there. And Reverend Joanne and I are going to take just a couple of quick minutes every Sunday just to remind us of the basics of this teaching, right? I mean, our founder, Ernest Holmes, it was in the mid-1900s, around in the 50s, and, you know, Oprah wasn't around then, right? This whole idea of it's all God <laughs> and meditation and all of those things weren't actually um, commonplace as they are today. And he founded this philosophy based on all of the readings and studying that he had done. And it's really, truly a mixture of Eastern and Western culture. And it's practical. It helps us create a personal, intimate relationship with God, with our soul, with the one, whatever you call it. It allows us to take complete and total responsibility for our lives when it's working and when it isn't working. Right? We get to be responsible. And by being responsible, we can change it. In this teaching, we learn that life is a balance. It's a balance of harmony and joy and love. And it's all about being a beneficial presence on this earth. Because when we thrive, others thrive with us. When we do good, others see the reward in terms of a smile, and they do good. Ernest Holmes wrote, this philosophy is of nothing new to the world. It is rather a synthesis of the greatest concepts that have ever come to the mind of humankind. The, law of, the laws of Moses, the love of Christ, the ethics of Buddha, the morals of Confucius and the deep spiritual realization of the Hindus. Uh, they all find a place, an exalted place in this philosophy. So I share that because, you know, we come together on Sundays for a couple of reasons, right? We come together to feel the love in this room. We come together on streaming to feel the love of everything that is around us. We come to share the light that's in our individual hearts and allow it to radiate bigger and brighter because we become more willing. And we come here to share a wealth of understanding from a spiritual perspective, to look at things that have happened or are happening in our lives and support each other, celebrate each other, we come here basically because we love ourselves. And we are ready to deepen that love. And in today's world where there's all kinds of uncertainty and I don't know about you, but all kinds of crazy happening, right? It's kind of hard to avoid it sometimes. It's hard to not get sucked into it sometimes, I must admit. But with everything going on, I believe it impacts those of us who are spiritually wealthy a little more. Because our hearts are always so open. And we're always so willing. But that doesn't mean we need to shut off the news or shut people off when they're going on their rants. We can just walk away. We can simply walk away, turn down the volume, and pick up in something inspirational just to keep ourselves grounded. And that is why we want to look at today and every, every Sunday this week this idea of abundance of good. Because as we focus on our good, 
we're bringing more good. Because we're all dynamic, vibrational spirits just here to elevate, to elevate it all. So I'm going to start off um, this month with a lesson from Jesus. Now remember, Jesus is the master teacher, we believe, not the master example. That he came here, that the parables and stories were made present for us to realize that there is just one and for us to, to embody it more deeply. And so as the master teacher, there's a fairly well-known scripture. Jesus said it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Has anyone not heard that before? Uh, my mother, um, my good Catholic mother, knew that phrase really well. <laughs> really well. And, and I believe when I look at that phrase from this philosophy, it really, it really is a catalyst for poverty, right? I mean, if you want to get to the kingdom, you got to let go of everything else. But that's not really what the story is about. If we go to Mark, Matthew, and Luke, they all write about this. But Mark, in particular, has a rich context to it. Now, this statement was made to a, a wealthy young man, very wealthy young man. He comes to Jesus and he says, I want, what do I need to do to become a follower? And he says, Jesus says, well, you, well my son, you've got you to sell everything. Sell everything. Um, and the guy wasn't so happy about that because his life was good, right? He just wanted it to make better. And selling everything to the poor made no sense to him whatsoever. So he walked away depressed, actually, depending on which, which version of this you read. But my version of the whole story is this. When Jesus, when he, su he surprised the disciples when he said this to this man. And before, but before he said that is a phrase that we don't usually hear. My sons, how hard is it for those who trust in their wealth to enter into the kingdom of God? You know, it's kind of darn hard to serve two masters, right? Now that is not to say that wealth is bad. Not at all that you can't be in the kingdom and still have wealth. That's totally incorrect. But that wealth is the substance of spirit, of God. It's the only thing that substance can be of. But in order to live life in the flow, we need to have some spiritual principles, some spiritual practices. We need to allow ourselves to not be controlled by wealth, but to live in support of wealth. If you think of wealth as money, as possessions, it's about not letting it control you or your life. It's not being too caught up in keeping a hold of it. It's about moving and appreciating and staying in the flow. He goes on a few verses after this, and he says, I truly say to you, there is no man who leaves houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wives or children or fields for my sake or for the sake of my gospel who shall not receive now in this time a hundredfold. So remember, it's a metaphor. It's a, it's a proverb that he's really talking through. And to me, you don't say you have to give up all your wealth and then turn around and say, and oh, by the way, I'm going to give it back to you a hundredfold. It doesn't, it doesn't literally mean that. I believe what this whole thing means is seek ye first the kingdom. The kingdom. And then all things should be added unto you. And that's the key. It's easier to, the whole 
verse would be, it's easier to pass, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a man who looks to his wealth as his God to find it. It's not about that insecurity and that unhappiness. But when he looks to God first, when she looks to God first, when any of us look to God first, all other things come to us naturally and easily. And we don't have to worry about holding on to it. We don't have to worry about where more is going to come from because it all comes from the one. So the metaphysical Bible defines wealth as true wealth as a state of consciousness, the consciousness of God as our supply. Our spiritual wealth expresses itself as faith, love, wisdom, substance, joy, and so forth. So wealth is all about a state of consciousness. It's all about knowing that it's here today, it could be gone tomorrow, and I'm grateful for what it is today. And I'm grateful for what I know is appearing tomorrow. Because when our consciousness is centered on that idea of oneness, of the real true fact that there's no place where God is not, then there's really no such thing as lack. A state of consciousness, it's all about our thoughts and our feelings and our beliefs. It's about our values. It's about our attitudes. It's about our suiting up and showing up as our authentic selves. That, that state of consciousness is what brings us into the kingdom of heaven. And just that, that's all it is. I'm focusing on Eric Butterworth today, but this month we're going to be looking at a couple of our favorite authors, Charles Fillmore on prosperity. We've got Napoleon Hill and Catherine Ponder, her dynamic laws of prosperity. It's a little dense, but it's worth it. But today, I want to talk about the truth of substance, which is actually a chapter in Butterworth's book, <clears throat> Spiritual Economics. And in there, he quotes Emily Cady, he, and who says, God is not a being with qualities or attributes, but God is the good itself coming into expression as life, love, power, and wisdom. In other words, God is not loving. God is the allness of love. God is not wise, but God is the essence of wisdom. God is not the dispenser of substance, but God is the ever-present substance in which we live, we move, and we have our being. In which we live, we move, and we have our being. And that, my friends, is how I know we're all wealthy. Already. Because we all have that state of consciousness, that state of awareness. God is not the dispenser of divine substance, but God is the ever-present substance that we live, move, and celebrate. The wholeness of God, the entirety of God, is present every moment, in every space, all of the time. All of the time. God doesn't come and go. He doesn't show up because you're praying, right? It doesn't show up because you're praying. It is, it is the prayer of your thoughts on a regular, consistent basis. It's that first cause. God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to go up there and get something and bring it down for you from the storehouse. There is no up there. There's right here and right now. Always present. Think about that, because that's, that's a big one. Always present, totally present, as the presence, whether we're aware of it or not. So 
you may be praying for health, but know that you are right here in the wholeness of God present around you of health. We may be praying for that one special love, but right here and right now, the wholeness of God's love is what we are breathing. You may be, we may be praying for a greater abundance of whatever it is we're looking for more of, but all of the substance of God is right here where we are. It's kind of hard to get your head around. It's a stretch. But it's the law, just like the law of gravity. There's no place where gravity is not. There's no, right? Unless it's a false cr cr condition that man has created. Mary Morrissey once said that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Just because we can't see it, feel it, touch it all of the time does not mean it's not totally and completely present. Butterworth goes on to write in his first chapter, there is no place in the universe where substance is more present or has less present than right where you are right now. And though you can accumulate, store away material riches, there is no way you can amass substance. In contrast to this, you could lose all of your assets in a financial crisis, but you can never lack substance. The awareness of this principle marked the difference in the crash of 1929 between those who picked themselves up and went on and those who jumped out of a window. A person who keeps a conscious thought, a, a consciousness, a spiritual consciousness, will always be in the divine flow. Will find expression, will find a way to be genuinely in service and of service and well rewarded. It could be said that when you realize your relationship to the dynamic universe, you are forever in a field where you can drill for oil and bring up a gusher every time. Every time. Remember the story of the woman who had no oil? She had one jar and that was it. And she went and got more jars and she kept getting more oil. And the more she believed in her source, the more she had to give and to share. I think we've all had times when we didn't know how we were gonna make it, but somehow we made it. I remember my very first, I've had a few unemployment issues. But my first unemployment issue, I remember I was living alone in Huntington Beach, California, and you know, there was just, there was just like no way. I was gonna make it, there was just no way. So I just, you know, there was reason to think about lack because I'm like so steeped at it, you know? Um, so I did what I needed to do to find a job, but then I got creative and did other things. I decided, you know what, I'm just, I'm, I just know. Don't know why, just know. And I hadn't even started this teaching yet. And, and so out of the blue, I get a call from a former customer who asked me if I can help him with a contract he just signed with a telecommunications company in Belize that was opening up a call center. Okay, yeah, you can pay me to do that. And then some guy from LA had gotten my name somehow and he had, um, he was, he was, he had a generic computer and this wonderful group of people that would do computer repair by contract and he was ready to take it to market. And he's like, would you come and help me do this for three months? And I'm like, sure, <laughs> I, can, I can do that. I've never really done marketing, but whatever, we can do this. And somehow everything just, I don't know, it just all came into place. Because I wasn't thinking about lack, there was no need to think about lack, because I was like up to here in lack. 
And somehow things just always appeared. I decorated the tree in my front yard with cut out, cut out snowflakes, white snowflakes, and hung them with red yarn. And um, I won the contest from the association for $100. I was like, oh, I can go grocery shopping again. This will be great. But do you remember t a time in your life when it was just like, oh, all right, I'm just going to, you know, let it all, I'm just going to step into it and do what I need to do, and I'm not going to let it stress me out. And then, on the other end, it's all good. And you have no idea how you got from A to B, but you did, and you're glad that you don't remember anything in between. Right? You, we've all had that. I love that because it is said in this teaching that the universe cannot support a vacuum, right? And the idea being, right, if there, there's no place where God is not. So when we start, when we're in a place down there somewhere, because this hole has been created in our life, whether it's unemployment or health or relationship or whatever, right? That space has to be filled with something. And we can either fill it with fear, worry, lack, doubt, right? Or we can say, all right, spirit, you're right here, you're right now, fill this hole. Literally fill this hole. You know, in physics, they talk about the fact that empty spaces are unstable. They're unstable. And so it's really important that they get filled as quickly as possible with material, with particles, with something. It can't just remain unstable. So when we allow that emptiness, when we just give thanks and be grateful for it, whatever that is, we allow space, I believe, for the universe, for the substance of good, to fill it. Because we haven't rushed to fill it ourselves. And if we let the universe fill it, it won't be full of lack or any kind of muck. It just won't. So, this month, Reverend Joanne and I invite you to join us as we make a deeply rooted commitment to practice the presence of God. While we're doing dishes, while we're vacuuming, while we're dusting, to practice that presence, to know that right here, the air that we're breathing is God's love. The warm water that's coming out of that faucet is expression of wonderful substance, of precious substance. Take a shower and just be fully present in that shower. Just remember God is in that shower stall with you. It is the stall. It is the water. And yes, it's a bit much to wrap your head around. But when you start to wrap your head around it, then when those fears show up, you start to think to yourself, why? Why am I afraid of that? It's just another expression of God. Just another expression of God. Find an affirmation that you can use. Find an affirmation that fills you. Find an affirmation like this one. Say it with me. God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. That is our truth. Can you feel that as your truth? Because it is. And with that, let's pray. Oh, in this moment, I just celebrate the truth. I celebrate the truth that there is only one, and that one which I call God, that one that goes by so many names is ever-present. And it experiences its creation 
is I experience my life. And I know this is true for every single person here. So join me as I declare, as I declare right here and right now, that life is abundant. That the state of consciousness of knowing the one, of that wealth, it is the one here and now. I am willing to be willing to allow more love, more joy, more peace, more of all of it in to my life with a grateful heart. I am ready to be wealthy. Wealthy. I am ready for that Christ consciousness to be ever present. I let go of anything that is holding me back from my divine expression. And I just say, life, let's go do this. Let's go do this bigger and better and higher. And let's take a lot of people with us. <laughs> and so with a heart that is open, with gratitude for all that has been, all that is, and all that will be, I let this go. I let God do the heavy lifting in my life. And I just celebrate. And so it is. Thank you.